Although I'm going to talk a little bit about diversity, technology, hiring, what I'm really talking about is human connections, right? We know they matter where we grow up, the people, our parents, the community we live in, the zip, co zip code we're born, the conversations we have, the late night walks, they all shape us, these little moments. You can't even imagine, even today, the choice to come today, how that affected who you are and the opportunities that you're going to have ahead. This is me as a kid, and uh, you can see where the hula hoop contest came from, right? <laughs> but I actually grew up in a really conservative Christian home. Uh, when I was younger, I thought gay people all lived in San Francisco. <laughs> Not, I'm 100% sure, I really thought they all lived in San Francisco and that they were all going to hell. That was my experience. But when I went to Thailand, I realized, you know what, if I was born in Thailand, I'd be Buddhist. 95% odds that I'd be Buddhist if I was born in Thailand. And that idea, it totally changed who I am and sort of shaped the person that I've become, right? And I grew up, my dad was a PE teacher, so by all means I should have also been a PE teacher, not just because I'm a lesbian. <laughs> um, there was like, Leanne, are you going to coach PE? Or are you going to teach math? You're obviously going to do basketball, softball, and volleyball. I was like, eh, I don't know. Something about that feels not right. Um, and this is just a side note, this is my brother, Tim, in the picture. He actually passed away seven years ago yesterday. And um, he's the first Les Rouse. So you see the t-shirts, that's actually what I used to call him, my brother, brother of a lesbian. So that's where it came from. But he was actually learning JavaScript when he passed away. He was teaching himself, literally, JavaScript 101. And even that connection, it opened my eyes to technology in an entire new way. And I probably actually wouldn't be standing here today in front of you had that moment not happened. So think about all the connections that we make all the time. We can actually predict our wealth as humans with almost 90% certainty based on the zip code that we were born in. Think about that. We like to believe we live in this country where we can pull ourselves up from our bootstraps and that anything is possible. To some degree, that is also true. But it's also true that so much of our life is predetermined by the zip code that we were born in. And then we have the internet, right? And to some degree, we think, oh, the internet is going to change the game. Access, education, all of these open ideas, they're, they're limitless possibilities. And this is actually a picture of partisanship in our country. The blue is Democratic and, and the red is Republican. And you can see up here, we were more partisan up here. And you go through the years, and this is about when the internet starts, 1993 in here, right? We are all the way over here to 2011. And even with this open information, access, education, we're more divided than ever. So here's what we know. We know a lot of things. I know this room is very smart, but here's what we know for right now. Um, the world is not fair. It's really not fair. <laughs> I just, you know, it's there. It's there healing for me to do this. Um, humans are biased, right? We're literally psychologically programmed to connect with people who are like us who share things in common. It feels actually less risky to hire someone who's like us because we know, we know us, right? We know who we are most of the time. Um, we know who we are. And so it feels just better to connect with people who we are. So it's no surprise that our networks are also biased, right? We know we live in a systemic, overtly racist, sexist, anti-LGBTQ world. And so it's no surprise that our tech companies are facing these same issues, right? We've all seen the stats. They're not very good. So we've got some problems, probably more than 99 problems, but <laughs> um, representation, right? Look around. Tech doesn't look like this, right? You've spent a day, right? You like it though, right? It feels good? Yeah? <laughs> in a few years, we're going to have 1.2 million open jobs in this country, right? And it's not just jobs, it's economic opportunity. It's the future that America promises, right? The average salary right now in the U.S. is 29000 You know what the average tech salary is? It's $83,000. That is huge. That is so huge from a national average perspective. It could literally change your life. And it's not just from an individual's perspective, although that's really important. But we're talking about the future of our country, the future, future of the country we want to be. 
And like I mentioned before, hiring is all about eliminating risk. For how innovative our, our companies are, self-driving cars, curing cancer, we have, we have got hiring down to a science. And the safest way to hire someone is through direct referrals and maybe hiring from you know, the same school that Google hires from or whatever you know, tech company is on top. Um, but that's, that's the system. That's what's the safest. That's what produces the best results. So if I'm biased, our networks are biased, and direct referrals are the safest way to hire, how are we going to change that? And especially when you start as companies, right? So if your founding team is white, straight, cisgendered, male, they went to MIT or Stanford, guess what? Direct referrals, your network's going to look like that. The problem's just going to get worse for you as you grow. It's going to look just like this. <laughs> and this is the image that most Americans have. You know, and, and you know, this is why when people come here, they're like, oh my god, Leanne, I had no idea. I'm like, right, we exist, we're out there. And technology in the last five years has spent about $1.2 billion to solve this problem. Let me say that again, they spent $1.2 billion, and yet we're exactly where we were, maybe a little bit, but not by much. And yet, Lesbians Who Tech has been able to build this diverse, ecosystem, this community of people who are building rocket ships and curing cancer, who've been the CTO of the United States. So I have a few lessons that we've actually all done together. You've taught me, I've taught you, we've, we built this community together. Um, and I like to just say a side note because I've actually, you'd be shocked how many times I've had to tell people this, but lesbians are also women. <laughs> it's like, it gets awkward and then it, we warm up and it's like, it's okay. Um, and lesbians are women of color, we're transgender women, we are so many things. Right? And we've been able to build this community where we can have hula hoop contests, which is coming soon, get ready, think about it. Um, and we've done it by being intentional. Right? We've actually used quotas. I'm pro quotas. I believe that uh, without quotas, things don't change. Um, and you have to create urgency to create change. We've had quotas for 50% women of color, 25% black and Latinx, 10% transgender and gender nonconforming since the very beginning. And I fully believe without those quotas, without tracking it, using data, we would not have met them. It takes intention. You have to set focus on it. When I stop focusing on it, guess what? It gets more white. Actually, this year had a few. Uh, we had, uh, I was like, there's no men that can speak. Except, and they're like, oh, what? I'm like, it's a, as lit, and it's, it's all right. We got through it. <laughs> um, but quotas don't lower the standard. They do not lower the standard. They just change the criteria. Because guess what? If you're trying to hire a CEO, to take a company public, and you say, hmm, well, I have to hire someone who's already taken a company public. Guess what that list looks like, right? How are we going to change that? You can't change our representation issue if you don't change the criteria. In Norway, um, they, you know, they passed a law that said a certain percentage of women have to be on boards. And it didn't lower the standard. What it did, it, it got them thinking outside the box. What other things can we measure? Because again, the people of power in this country, they're setting the rules. Right? So why should it be just like it's always been? Why can't we flip the script? You have to use data to track it. It's so important. And something we've done from the beginning is build trust. Right? Most LGBTQ groups, they're white, they're male. And so guess what? When we started, people thought we were going to be the same. What we did, we went into other spaces. We said, what do you need? What value are you looking for? Can I put you on stage? Can I give you a voice? Maybe I'll just go to your event first, and I won't even ask you for anything. We built trust. And part of trust is giving first. And one of my favorite stories about giving first is Megan Smith, who you'll hear from in a second. But she um, was at Google at the time, and uh, I asked her to speak at the first ever LGBT Tech and Innovation Summit at the White House. And she said, yeah, she changed her summer plans, um, you know, made it happen as she usually does. And it was there that began her conversation to becoming the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. Think about that impact. Giving first, she chose to give first and make that happen. And we all got to benefit from that impact, right? We got a more than qualified candidate for CTU of the United States out of that. So giving first can be so huge, right? She showed up. You guys all showed up here today. It's so important to show up. And people with privilege, they need to show up more, right? We're all tired. You know, I know so many people that always, get, oh, we need a woman, we need a woman of color on a panel to come to this thing. It's like, whew, it's hard. Right? So the people with more privilege, with more time, with more energy, with more money, a better start in life, we have to actually show up harder. 
and we have to show it for ourselves. I made a lot of jokes about lesbians in my past, about staying home and watching Scandal and drinking wine, <laughs> which you can do sometimes. I want to be clear, it is very important to do, it is very healing. <laughs> it is, it is. And you can have a cat or a dog. Is team cat or dog winning on the app? I was curious. Yeah, well, dog, dog. Whew. Um, but it's, it's so important to show up, right? I mean, so many of our lesbian spaces are dying, and part of that is because we've stopped showing up. But that's been the beautiful thing about Lesbian 2 Tech, and I hope that you feel that too. It's given me so much faith in the queer women community that we can show up. We can show up with both our time and with our money. Because remember from this morning, what's more scalable, your time or your money? Money. money. Your money is much more scalable, and it's on us to use that money, especially with people with more privilege, to change this. And I'm so proud of you. We've all opted into this type of community, so much so that we have 25,000 members all over the world. And I'm still shocked that that is true. Um, because like I said, I really did not think this would become a thing. I thought we'd be a happy hour once a year and you guys would get bored of it and be like, ugh, and I'd have to change the name to something else you didn't know was actually Lesbians Who Tech, <laughs> which happens all the time. Um, so human connections, right? So Lesbians Who Tech, we've done it. We've built this diverse community that's actually representative. So what if we had the answer to solving the billion dollar problem? What if we could help companies reflect the people that live in this country? What if we could increase economic opportunity for all? What if we could scale human connections outside of our bias networks? So we've launched two experiments, two new companies. My wife is really excited about this, by the way. Um, but Lesbians Who Tech is behind this. I know many of you have seen the emails. Uh, it's called the Tech Jobs Tour. You might have seen a video on it earlier. It's one year, 50 cities, 100,000 jobs. But what it really is, is we're going to communities, we're listening, we're building trust, we're showing up, we're saying, what do you need? How can we provide you value? How can we connect the employers with the individuals that are seeking jobs? How can we connect people who need opportunity to learn how to code? What do you need? What's your first step? Do you need a mentor? Great, let's do some speed mentoring. How many of you did speed mentoring? Right? Did you like it? Did you, yeah? That's what we're doing all over the country, so we can connect and build those connections. In fact, these are all our cities, so you should join us. This is Bill. I met him in uh, West Virginia a couple weeks ago. He is amazing, by the way. He's this chemist. He has ideas to clean uh, toxic water. We connected him to other entrepreneurs who are working on this problem. And he emailed, and so the tech job store, although it has, it has the Lesbians Who Tech logo on it, it's not something we sort of roll into West Virginia with, right? We're not like, and welcome to Lesbians Who Tech. It's not the same vibe. <laughs> Um, we don't hide it though, we don't hide it, but it's just, it's, you know, it's not the same high five love fest that is here. Um, and I spent some time with Bill and then he emailed me later and he said, you know, are you the woman behind Lesbians Who Tech? And it just, you know, this is Bill, right? I mean, we all have our assumptions about Bill in West Virginia. <laughs> you know? And you know, I said yes and he said, you know, my grandniece, um, She's a lesbian, and I'd love her to connect with you. And it just, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it, right? Like, this is the power of human connections and relationships. If I hadn't gone to West Virginia, maybe he never would have told his grandniece who, I don't know, maybe she needs this community so desperate, desperately. This could really change her life, just knowing that this exists, right? So although we're talking about jobs and hiring, it's, it's bigger than that. It's more powerful than that. So obviously in-person connection is huge, but we've also built a product, which I'm sure many of you have got emails about too. It's called include.io. And part of what it's trying to solve is that access to direct referrals, right? How can we access connections outside of our own bias networks? How can someone who's a senior software engineer at Amazon connect with someone who's been self-taught in Nashville, who doesn't have that referral that she needs to get the job that she deserves, right? How can we connect people together so that when Amazon you know, they know the safest way to hire is through direct referrals. They can go on and they can literally search by people who've been vouched for by Amazon, right? We're scaling that. So we're going across the country with the tour. We're meeting people in person, them, in person, getting them on the product, and hoping to scale this through 30-minute mentoring sessions, right? And you don't have to say this person would, you know, totally nail the job, that they're going to be in it forever. You just have to vouch for them that they get a chance for an interview, right? A low barrier to entry. So what we're doing here, we're engineering relationships through direct referrals. But if that doesn't work, maybe the best way to hire women and people of color is just to hire them. Thank you.